What's up, everybody? This is Alex Christopher with the Duran, and I'm here with Mark Sloboda, International Affairs and Security Analyst from Moscow. And today we're going to be taking a look at the partition of Syria and how it's connected to unrest in China. Okay, Mark, I'm just going to um, just come out and just ask it to you directly as to what plan B is for Syria now that I think it's pretty safe to say that regime change, removing Assad, is is pretty much off the table, it seems um, safe to say. Of course, you can comment on that as well. But is plan B, is now the plan of the U.S., of Saudi Arabia, of Israel, of Turkey, is it now partition of Syria? Yeah, it, I mean, partition of Syria, it has long been the neocons' plan B uh, for Syria. This goes all the way back to the... The very beginning of the conflict, you can take a look at uh, Brookings deconstructing Syria. I mean, they were writing the, the blueprint back then. And uh, Rand Corporation has more recently come out with a more updated version that also deals with, you know, what they, they would call zones of influence. It is, is basically regime change has failed, bar a decapitation strike on um, uh, President Assad and a great deal of his entourage, which... Quite interestingly, uh, the Western media has suggested that that Trump did demand, actually, um, uh, in his most during the most recent um, uh, supposed uh, attack in retribution for um, chemical attack in Duma, which um, at least in terms of Sarah never happened. Now, according to the OPCW reports, um, that he wanted to take uh, take us all out, take them out, take them all out. And evidently, uh, Mattis walked him back uh, from that one and just walked out of the room and said, we're not going to do that. Um, but bar, bar something like that in, in the near future, bar such a decapitation strike, um, regime change uh, you know, has failed. Uh, thanks, of course, largely due to the efforts of Russia and Iran and Syria's other allies. Um, but, you know, partition is very much reality and has been for a long time. Um, Turkey controls um, all of the Drabless corridor area, stretching from Afrin all the way over to Mambij. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, you know, the titular city there, there is Drabless, uh, Drabless city right across the Turkish border. This is across the uh, northern border of Syria with Turkey. Um, and they uh, invaded, uh, you know, j just over a year ago now, though, and uh, they are setting up a proxy government. They've uh, turned their, their former uh, Islamist and jihadist militias, part of the, um, uh, formerly part of the Free Syrian Army and uh, Har al Sham, the Al Qaeda splinter uh, jihadist group, into what they call the new Syrian Army. And it's, it's jihadists, you know, cosplaying in Turkish proxy uniforms. And they're, they're well on the way, setting up Turkish uh, national uh, post offices. They're teaching the kids Turkish in schools and, and, and so on. Uh, so they're not going anywhere. And they would like to do the same with Idlib. And that is the big point of contention right now uh, between um, uh, Russia and Syria and Iran on one side and, and, and uh, Turkey and Al Qaeda and the other uh, jihadis on the other side. Um, and it seems uh, there's going to be a meeting uh, come Monday um, uh, next week between uh, Putin and uh, Erdogan, again, uh, specifically on the issue of Idlib. Um, and we might see a partition of Idlib, where those that are areas that are controlled directly by um uh, Al-Qaeda and its most immediate allies, HTS and its allies like the Turkestan Islamic Party, um, will uh, uh, be attacked by the Syrian government, while Turkey will likely, at least for the time being, retain control of areas controlled by their proxy National Liberation Front, uh, which would be, again, Ahar al-Sham and the, the formerly U.S.-backed child head choppers of Al-Zinki uh, and several other groups. Um, and then, of course, you have the entire uh, east of Syria, east of the Euphrates, which is controlled by the U.S.-backed Syria Democratic Forces, which is largely Kurds 
and some local Arab tribes. Although uh, lately, uh, the U.S., um, as it begins to begin a rapprochement uh, with Turkey, uh, particularly over the issue of uh, kicking the Syrian Democratic Forces out of Mambij and turning it over to Turkish proxies, um, uh, that relationship uh, is souring. And the Kurds are starting uh, slowly to make overtures uh, towards the Syrian government and prepare for a, a eventual scenario where the U.S. may be driven out of East Syria. But that is not on the table right now anyway, and the U.S. seems to be setting in for the long haul um, with the U.S. official strategy, uh, according to the U.S. envoy for Syria, James Jeffrey, saying that um, uh, the U.S. is going to have an indefinite, that is a forever, military presence in Syria until all of um, uh, Syria's Iranian allies uh, withdraw from the country, again, dictating who in uh, uh, Syria can and cannot ally with and have on their own territory, and another of other conditions. Like, they say they're not for regime change, but they say they're not leaving until a country, a government um, that, is, um, up, that is acceptable to the, quote, international community. Um, meaning them uh, and their allies, uh, you know, the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and so on, uh, is in power in Damascus. So the U.S. isn't going anywhere. Partition of Syria is uh, very much uh, happening. And uh, this, this brings us into uh, in, in a, uh, a related issue, uh, which is uh, the potential uh, for uh, a movement towards uh, the partition of, or at least the destabilization of Eastern China. And there is a connection uh, between these uh, two stories. And this happens to do with a, a minority ethnic group uh, in Eastern China, the Chinese, uh, the, well, they, they actually are a, a Central Asian ethnicity, but they are, have long been Chinese citizens, the Uyghur peoples, uh, which are uh, a Muslim, largely Muslim ethnic minority um, in uh, eastern China, and this is, uh, they're primarily located within Xinjiang province. The Xinjiang province is a large, desert, mountainous, a sparsely habitated region. Um, there's, it's an area the size of Germany, France, the Netherlands, and the UK, all thrown together. It's larger than that, and there's 24 million people there, and about 45 percent of them are ethnic Chinese Uyghurs. Uh, they've, uh, you know, long been part of China. There have been, uh, you know, disgruntlements, um, some integration, not enough, and so on. But in within the past, you know, two two and a half decades, there has been a injection of um, Wahhabism, also sometimes called Salafist Islam, which is not traditional uh, to um, the uh, Uyghur Muslim peoples. It is a harsh um, a, uh, fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. It, it is also happens to be the official religion of the U.S. allied Saudi dictatorship, you know, the, the absolute dictatorship uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar have long um, promoted this religion around the world. And I don't think it's a, a, a stretch to say that well over 90% of what we often call uh, in the U.S. Uh, radical Islam, uh, you know, we speak of terrorism uh, at, at least done uh, in the name of um, um, extremist Islamic factions as radical Islam. That's the term that uh, Trump and some of the others like to use. This is a harshly inaccurate term. Uh, because, of course, the vast majority of uh, the Islamic peoples of the world, whether we're talking, um, you know, the Sunni branch, the Shia branch, the, the uh, uh, Sufi sub-branch, are, of course, not terrorists. And they are actually the biggest victim of these terrorists. But well over 90% of these so-called radical Islamic terrorists are, in fact, Wahhabists. They, are, they adhere uh, to the Wahhabist or the Salafist uh, uh, interpretation of Islam promoted by madrasas and schools and, and funding and, of course, arms out of Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar. Now, this is a big problem. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., um, it is politically incorrect, of course, to 
um, uh, talk about radical Islam and, and terrorism and jump to conclusions and, and the prejudice that can then result. And that is correct in a way. But the U.S. government officials refuse to say the word Wahhabism. They refuse to say the word Salafism and acknowledge that that is the root of the majority of what we call radical Islamic terrorism around the world because they're so far in bed with the Saudi government, selling them hundreds of billions of dollars of arms. Um, and uh, of course, the question of control of oil and petrodollar. So. Yeah, the petrodollar. So um, this injection of Wahhabism uh, into uh, the, the Xinjiang uh, region, the, the Uyghur peoples of China, has led to some unrest in that area. Um, it, it, uh, bombings, terrorism, riots, uh, and so on. Again, usually the, the principal victims of this are, are, are other Uyghurs themselves. Uh, not incidentally, the U.S. has also um, uh, simultaneously promoted separatist movements be, via Uyghur um, um, expatriate oligarchs in the United States. Uh, their usual uh, you know, the CIA playbook of, of, of creating uh, fake movements um, centered around influential uh, expats and shadow governments that are set up in the United States. Um, and this comes with a, a report that the Duran has already covered with, with you and Alexander Mercoris examining this issue, this, this fake news propaganda issue of a million Chinese Uyghurs in uh, concentration camps or re-education centers, when the reality is that, you know, it is uh, hundreds, possibly in the low thousands, and um, it is the Salafists that are being um, isolated um, by um, the Chinese government. And the, the connection there, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so these Uyghurs now are in, I mean, this is a group of people in Syria, in Idlib right now, and is this, this is, from what I understand and what you're saying, this is forcing China's hand to get involved in Syria in order to stop the damage from spreading to China. Yeah, there are several thousand Chinese Uyghur Wahhabists uh, that are part of an Islamic uh, terror group uh, and movement that has long been allied with Al Qaeda called the Turkestan Islamic Party. It is largely composed of Chinese Uyghurs, some also other Central Asian peoples, uh, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, but it, it, the majority are Uyghurs. And uh, several years ago in the conflict, quite early in the conflict, the Turkish government helped relocate it, uh, trained and armed uh, several thousand of these um, and moved them from this region uh, into Syria, uh, them, their families, and so on, basically creating a uh, Uyghur Wahhabist uh, again, it's not all Uyghurs, it's this fringe minority of them infected with Wahhabism, uh, colony um, in uh, Syria, uh, largely in um, western Idlib, uh, bordering uh, into a uh, part of uh, Latakia province. And the Syrian government and Russia have long been uh, fighting them there. And at this moment, that is one of the big militias still left in Idlib, this Turkestan Islamic movement. There's uh, some three to four thousand of this Turkestan Islamic, largely Chinese Uyghurs, um, uh, in Idlib, in a, a western city called Jisr al Shagur, which is one of the primary targets um, of uh, Russian airstrikes in the past few weeks because of the number of attacks out of this area. And these are hardcore Chinese, uh, you know, formerly Chinese citizen jihadists. And China. Is, feels such a threat of, of these people eventually being uh, defeated, uh, but um, uh, uh, not all killed, uh, or uh, you know even worse, succeeding and starting to uh, you know settle out with a nest that spreads roots back to China. Either way, of, of one form or the other, of, of these people starting to come home and uh, restarting you know armed insurgency and terrorism. Um, in Xinjiang province uh, and, and elsewhere in China. And there was uh, some kind of um, unrealistic, uh, largely internet rumors that China might actually send troops to Syria. That's not going to happen. 
Uh, but, of course, China has long been a very strong political voice at the UN Security Council in support of the Syrian government in Russia. And they have indicated multiple times that uh, as this conflict winds down, they intend for Syria to be one of the end conduits of their one belt, one road, uh, new economic policy uh, from uh, development and transportation from uh, uh, Western China, uh, Xinjiang province through Central Asia and ending in, in you know, parts of Russia, Europe uh, and Syria. And that is how they will help uh, inject large amounts of money to help rebuild Syria. And, and you know, that 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 could help a lot right there. Um, but they've, we've still got this issue of, uh, you know, these several thousand uh, Chinese Uyghur uh, jihadis uh, in Syria that has to be dealt with and their potential threat uh, for returning home. Um, and this ties in with this whole ex uh, hysteria that is being created with this propaganda story about a million uh, people in re-education camp. There are re-education centers, you know, a, a few hundred people. Um, recently, there was an article in the New York Times um, that talked about these camps. There's been a, a, a slew of them across the Western media. And one official directive uh, warns people to look for 75 signs of uh, religious extremism, including behavior that would be considered unremarkable in other countries. Growing a beard as a young man, praying in public places outside mosques, or even abruptly trying to give up smoking or drinking. And they're saying that this is some signs that they are looking for in Xinjiang province for people that may have been infected with, a, you know, uh, violent Salafism and are in need of watching or, or, or you know, possibly even some re-education. Where, where, where does Turkey lie on all of this? Is Turkey for the Uyghurs? I mean, are they supporting the Uyghurs or are they more aligned with China? Because it, it wouldn't, wouldn't you say that it's in Turkey's best interest and much of the region's best interest outside of the U.S. if the one belt, one road does happen. I mean, why would yeah, they yeah. want to impede that? Um, that? That's a good question. And you're right. It doesn't make a, law, a lot of sense uh, for Erdogan. Uh, but you have to remember that Erdogan is an Islamist. And that is a fundamental part of his, his motivation, uh, his thought process. And, you know, that has led to him believing that he can regain uh, Turkic uh, and Islamist influence throughout Central Asia into Eastern China. And, of course, this neo-Ottoman aspirations in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. And long ago, he made his bed with these people. And, and of course, if he abruptly turned his back on them, then he would have a, the threat of several, you know, uh, thousand Chinese Uyghur jihadists that he armed and trained up specifically for terror of, of, of the most brutal kind that would, uh, you know, be returned on him. But he hopes to settle these people in Syria. Um, you know, that is it, it has been part of his interest. And, and this has brought him uh, into the conflict ostensibly, you know, against China. And of course, China can't, of course, ignore the, 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 the fact, you know, however strained relations are right now. That Turkey is also a member of NATO, as, as ridiculous as that might seem, at least according to the uh, supposed values of, of NATO uh, and so on. But we were talking about these signs of, of jihadism that the Chinese are supposedly looking for in Uyghurs, and the New York Times is remarking how insane the idea of this is, except that the writers of the New York Times seem to be unfamiliar with their own New York police departments publishing a study on radic Islamic radicalization, i.e. Wahhabism, and what to look for, which includes giving up cigarettes, drinking, uh, gambling, and uh, urban hip-hop gangster clothing, wearing traditional Islamic clothing and growing a beard, uh, becoming involved in social activism and community is issues associated with Islam, joining or forming like-minded group of individuals, basically a mirror image of exactly what the Chinese yeah. are looking for. There. I, 
we we've acknowledged there's a problem with Islamic radicalization. Again, we don't dare say that the, the term Wahhabism or Salafism out of uh, fear of uh, endangering our relations with the Saudi dictatorship. Um, but uh, we have de-radicalization policies, uh, you know, uh, groups, uh, you know, funded by the government in the United States, very active online, looking for signs of radicalization. But God forbid the Chinese, which have an, in, uh, an indigenous, uh, uh, you know, a large uh, number of people that um, while you, you can't say, certainly can't say all Chinese Uyghurs are that, they are more susceptible to being infected, their communities, by this. And uh, in Russia, uh, we saw uh, something very identical happen in the 1990s with Chechen, where um, the um, Chechen uh, uh, separatist movement uh, was infected uh, with uh, a Wahhabism, and, and, and this directly came from Saudi Arabia uh, and Turkey, uh, Saudi-funded uh, madrasas and, and, and jihadists that were basically training and arming up in Turkey and elsewhere, um, and, and leading to a very brutal civil war in Chechnya, uh, which the Russian government uh, had to get involved in. Uh, and, and of course, the West uh, made a lot of noise about that. Never mind that today, Chechnya is a very autonomous republic run by Chechens of the traditional moderate Sufi branch of Islam um, that gets along very well uh, with you know, the rest of the peoples of Russia, uh, including the Orthodox Church, uh, but doesn't get along so well with, with the Wahhabists. And again, they uh, and other peoples in the Caucasus, their principal victims are not ethnic Russians or, or government officials. They are other of their own people, other Muslims who are not Wahhabists. Uh, that, that is always the nature of this Wahhabist um, uh, uh, extremism. extremism. And, and so to finish it up, uh, Mark, is the U.S.'s plan, do you think the U.S. Is, is, is stirring up a lot of the media? You mentioned the media. People are talking about the Uyghurs. You, you see it on Fox News. You see it on MSNBC, right or left. People are talking about it, and they're starting to, to make a lot of noise about what's happening uh, with the Uyghurs in China, true or not true. Do you think that part of this, this campaign with what's happening in Syria and the U.S. doubling down in Syria and a lot of the media about the Uyghurs is all about stopping Eurasian integration, you know, the fight for Eurasia. Do you see a, a larger U.S. geopolitical plan here to, to impede China? Yeah, yeah, sure. This is this is all about, I mean, um, uh, of course, with the issue of regime change off the board, you know, at least for Erdogan and that branch of NATO and so on there, it is about his footprint, his control of these areas and, and settling these Uyghur colonists. For the U.S. and the other countries, they see the one belt, one road, uh, first of all, as an economic threat, all right, helping to grow uh, China economically, uh, but also the political influence that will be gained from that, which includes, I think, as you uh, rightly noted, a, a high degree of Eurasian integration under the One Belt, One Road, which connects into Russia's Eurasian Union. And, you know, it wasn't so long ago that a Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, talked about the Eurasian Union as the reformation of the Soviet Union and a speech she gave in Ireland while she was still Secretary of State and said that that must be stopped at any cost, right? And that is what we're seeing here. I don't think that they seriously believe they can start a real um, uh, separatist movement in Xinjiang province, you know, uh, largely supported by uh, these Wahhabist Uyghurs um, anytime soon, but they're looking at destabilizing the area and destabilizing the one belt, one road. And we have to keep in mind, this is all in the context of a potential uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And if the U.S. withdraws from Afghanistan, they will, of course, want to keep it unstable for whoever comes in after them. And I've, I've been talking for, uh, you know, almost a decade now that if the U.S. withdraws from Syria, it is the Chinese and Russian-led Shanghai Cooperation Organization that will have to step in be, out of the, the threat of um, extremism, um, uh, uh, um, jihadism, uh, be it the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, or elsewhere, extending out of Afghanistan then 
uh, into Central Asia and, of course, into eastern China, uh, western China right there uh, in the uh, Xinjiang province. So it, it's all about destabilizing, destabilizing the potential for Eurasian unification, destabilizing China's one belt, one road and its economic and political influence through Central Asia there. And uh, once again, you know, we just see the United States taking advantage and exploiting, however cynically, a um, minority uh, jihadist uh, uh, particular group of people um, uh, in order to further, uh, you know, their geopolitical goals. We've seen it uh, in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen in the 1980s. Uh, we saw it in Libya. We saw it in uh, Yemen in the Cold War. We are still seeing the results of it in Syria. And now, uh, you know, we're seeing it start to become more intense uh, with uh, regards to uh, the Wahhabist um, infection of, uh, you know, the Chinese Uyghur Xinjiang province as well. Real quick, uh, Mark, uh, do you think a partition Syria can survive long term or medium term? Yeah, medium term, yes. Long term, no. The big problem there is that it, it, certainly the United States controls eastern Syria, which is where the vast majority of the oil is, which the Syrian government, of course, needs for reconstruction. The problem for the United States is how would they get that oil out of there? They can't do it while they're backing the Kurds uh, with Turkey because, of, of course, the, the harsh relations there with Turkey. Uh, so uh, that makes the economically unviable in the long term. Saudi Arabia has injected a lot of cash recently uh, to try to prop up the U.S. Uh, uh, proxy government that is being built in East Syria there. But that's not going to continue indefinitely. And certainly the United States doesn't want to invest the money to rebuild East Syria. Likewise, in North Syria with Turkey, it's extremely mountainous terrain. It's extremely difficult. It will be difficult to take back from Turkey. Russia is trying to avoid a war with Turkey at all costs there. Um, but Syria may have to, uh, at least in the medium term, recognize that they're not going to get back all of that territory in uh, North Syria, uh, but that will sour relations there, uh, in the, in, in, at least in the, in the medium term between Syria and Turkey and Russia, because Turkey just has given no indication that they are willing to withdraw from that area, um, even, you know, uh, especially with this uh, difficult relations they're also having you know, uh, in eastern Syria with the United States and the Kurds. Uh, so uh, partition, unfortunately, will be a reality in the medium term. In the long term, I don't see it as sustainable. Well, well what, would, what, would, what would be the outcome long term, do you think, if you had to venture forth with, with some sort of yeah, guess? Yeah. Uh, eventually, you know, the Kurds will come to a settlement uh, with the Syrian government for some degree of autonomy. I actually think by avoiding conflict with the Syrian government, if at any time they had fully allied with the Free Syrian Army and Al Qaeda, the Syrian government in Damascus would have fell. And nothing Russia or, or Iran, short of a major land incursion, could have prevented. They didn't do that. And even though they've crawled far too much under the U.S. wing after the number of times the U.S. has thrown the Kurds under the bus again and again and again in Iraq and elsewhere, um, I, I, hope i have some degree of faith that they will eventually come to their senses and see their best uh possibility for regaining some degree of the autonomy that they that they have acquired is with russia uh acting as their interculator with the syrian government um with uh idlib and, and, and so on there is no compatibility uh between um Anyone, you know, the Wahhabist, Salafists, anyone fighting for Sharia law in Syria with a multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, uh, secular Syrian republic. And they have to be driven out or killed. Period. Mark Sloboda from Moscow, International Affairs and Security Analyst. Thank you very much for a great discussion on Syria and China and the connection between the two. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on the notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video and visit the Duran shop, help support the Duran, buy a t-shirt. Mark Sloboda from Moscow. Thank you very much. Until next time, take care. Ching the Duran.